I'm wondering why you thought, uh, or why Socrates didn't uh, come, out, come out with a political doctrine. I mean, here he is, the moral philosopher. He's living in very troubled times. Yeah. I mean, isn't there something we can infer by his actions? He fought, he, did, he went to battle a few times. Yeah. Uh, and, and, but there must, there must, it's just odd that there is no political doctrine here that's coming out of this moral philosophy. Yeah, uh, that's, that's something that, uh, that I have Stone uh, finds very troubling too, that, you know, he, he feels let down by Socrates, that, that he didn't come out and take a stronger political stance. Uh, I mean, I, I guess I have to defer to you as a, as a moral philosopher. Do you think that um, taking a position in ethics immediately commits you I'm to... I'm a political philosopher, so I, I, I think moral philosophy and political philosophy just go hand in hand. And it would be hard to see how someone who was a moral philosopher wouldn't be really engaged, at least, at least at the level of theory, in the politics of their day. Yeah. It, that's hard for me. I mean, I know the philosophers that do this. We have philosophers who do meta-ethics. They, they try to say, I don't deal with any normative issues. But, you know, in troubling times, in a troubling place, it's very hard to sit back and yeah. not, not think about it. I mean, I, I think that Socrates um, behaved as an activist, just not a political activist. He behaved as a moral activist and an epistemic activist. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, you, you may think that he could have made himself more useful by doing other things, but, uh, you know, that he took that to be his divine mission. You and think he, he, he decided to stop short, to stay alive, or something like that? I mean, that would be one possibility. Uh, that comes up at times in the text that he, he says something to the effect that uh, I was only able to live to 70 years old because I kept as much out of politics as I could. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think he also thought it was more important to, to serve the, the moral mission that, that he thought he had been put on by Apollo. So, um, yeah, I mean, I understand your frustration and, you know, we all wish that, that he had come out more explicitly to take a stand. Um, but he is described as courageous. I mean, he, as you mentioned, he served in battle. He stood up to the tyrants when they told him to kill a certain man. He refused to do so, even though he could have himself been killed for that. They told him to stop his philosophical discoursing, and he then engaged them in a discussion about exactly what they meant by what he had to stop. So, I mean, he wasn't afraid. Uh, he certainly, you know, death wasn't an issue for him, even before he was 70 years old. So I think it's just a difference in how he evaluated what would be the most worthwhile for him, thing for him to do with his life, and you may disagree that he achieved that. But I think it's not because of laziness or cowardice, it's uh, just a different conclusion that he reached. Thanks a lot, Catherine. I was wondering if you could help me with uh, a tension that I'm having trouble resolving in the way you describe some of Socrates' uh, beliefs here. Um, one has to do with the, the sort of dismal verdict that he takes with respect to the level of expertise that he sees around him, in, in particular with respect to uh, the moral craft. And the other has to do with the kind of deference that you described him displaying with respect to the laws. Mm -hmm. um, so on the one hand, uh, if it turns out that there's very little expertise, right, moral yeah. expertise, which might translate into just political expertise, uh, which then uh, you know, produces the laws of the state, um, if that's you know, entirely bankrupt, uh, what is the source of his great deference to the laws, which then ultimately results in him choosing not to escape? Right? I mean, what is it that that drives him to have such a high uh, uh, view of 
of that particular institution, given the lack yeah. of expertise that went into producing them? Well, I think this relates to Dunn's question. It's that he, uh, by spending his entire life in Athens and uh, taking himself to have entered into an agreement with the laws, he now finds himself to be obliged to subject himself to these laws, even when he finds that the verdict that they reached was unjust. So because, but for him to persuade the laws, right, to change them would have required him being a political activist, which he chose not to for the reasons I just outlined, because he thought that his efforts could be better spent by being a moral activist. So I think that um, he, you know, he never left Athens except when he was required to do so um, as a soldier. He got married under the laws of Athens, he raised his children under the laws of Athens, he carried out his philosophical activities under the laws of Athens until the age of 70. And during that time, he never persuaded the laws to be other than the, what they were. And so at this point, it's not so much deference, I think it's more, um, I don't know, integrity or honesty, that because he didn't change the laws, now he has to endure whatever they decide, even if he thinks it's unjust. Right. So could I, could I just follow up with one yeah. very quick, quick question? So I mean, there's, a, a, there's further... a question as to whether, you know, if they had been different laws, so if, let's say, he had been born in Sparta, would he have either left or tried to change the laws much earlier? Because he wouldn't have been able to carry out his philosophical activities. So the fact that Athens had the laws that it did it allowed him until the age of 70 to carry out what he thought was his divine mission. And so even though he thought they weren't perfect, um, that's what he ended up with. Right. So just one further clarification on this sort of, you know, silence is complicity sort of view. Um, was the fact that he uh, was complicit or, you know, uh, in virtue of not objecting to or trying to change the laws of Athens, uh, thereby signing up to them. Uh, is that a reflection of what you sometimes presented as his lack of interest in engaging in that kind of debate, or was it a function of his uh, assessment of his own expertise, that is, his own lack of expertise when it came to uh, political philosophy? Because I could yeah. see it going either way. I think both, both of those things, that he, he, um, he chose a moral mission instead of a political mission, and he also didn't consider himself to be sufficient um, right. Well, then, last last puzzle. It seems as though if it turned out that he lacked the competence to actually enter into that debate, mm -hmm. it's a little bit curious that he should then think that he's bound by uh, the laws just because he didn't oppose them. I mean, he has no expertise with which to persuade anyone to think otherwise. I don't see that last. Yeah. Well, maybe it doesn't fall. <laughs> Okay, uh, two things. First, it strikes me that he certainly did have a political project, namely Alcibiades and Critias, right? I mean, his students were his project. Teach those who inherit power to do more with their time than accumulate power. Of course, it horribly backfired, leading to the situation. Uh, but it's not quite fair to say he didn't have a political project. The moral project was a political project, I, I would take it. Uh, maybe you disagree, I don't know. But the second thing would be that I don't want to disagree with the social contract idea that he, mm -hmm. follow, he stays and dies because <clears throat> of loyalty to the laws, but I want to add another layer to it. He does this, this is the just thing to do because it's the only way to change the laws, right? If what the jurors are looking for is a scapegoat for the behavior of Alcibiades and Critias, then uh, the only way, they, they don't want him to die necessarily, they just want him to take the blame and by forcing them to commit injustice upon him is the only way to force them to see their own injustice. You might think that, right? Uh, I, I guess the first point you made, I don't, could you elaborate on that sure. a little more? How so, do you think that the moral mission 
automatically is a political mission. I, I didn't quite see that. So, what does one do when one is confronted with uh, an unchangeable political situation? Right? I mean, reading between the lines in the Republic, maybe you think the Republic is off the table because it's a middle dialogue, but uh, could be. I'm not an expert, as Socrates would say. Uh, <laughs> so you might, Socrates says, you know, boys, what are we going to do? We're in such a bad state. If only we had someone who, who cared more about virtue than about wealth and power, where could we find such a person, right? But of course, the boys are saying, oh, well, we know, we know two people who could fill this task. It's us, right? If you, train, if you train the sons of your corrupt leaders to be less corrupt, then perhaps when they grow up to be leaders themselves, things won't be quite so bad, right? So you think that he was particularly interested in Alcibiades and taking him on as a student and a lover because he thought that Alcibiades was going to become a future leader and so um, he could impart to him, Socrates could impart to Alcibiades the political convictions that he thought that he wanted him to rule in accordance with. Is that the idea? Yeah, I'm, I'm channeling uh, Robin Waterfield here. Mm -hmm. uh. um, I think there, there's definitely something, I mean, that it's a good question why it, they make an odd couple, uh, Socrates and, and Alcibiades for sure, right? But um, I think that uh, Alcibiades' potential definitely uh, had an attraction to Socrates. I, it, the way I read him, it wasn't necessarily that he was trying to instill in him pro-oligarchic, pro-Spartan views. It's rather that Alcibiades struck him as the kind of person who was so talented and so charismatic that he was either gonna go you know, way off the charts this way or way off the charts that way. Um, and that is an interesting project for, for Socrates, um, right, to try to, uh, to try to, I mean, on my reading, I would, I would think his concern was moral rather than political. Um, but you're right, it is an interesting question why, why those two uh, ended up together. Um, so, I, I mean, on my reading, Alcibiades didn't end up with the political views that he did because Socrates instilled them in him. Um, but rather Socrates was interested in him because the great deal of potential that he saw in him to either go wrong or become very admirable. He wasn't going to be sort of average and mediocre, right? I think we're on the same page then. Mm -hmm. Thanks. <laughs>